Okay, it looks like people have entered into our room. This is very exciting. Uh, welcome to Planning for Post-COVID at Institutions. We're really pleased to have you today. Um, I have some beginning information to share with you. Actually, I'm going to, in my welcome, I also want you to see that we have an agenda for today. So, um, the initial information to share, I'm getting to the right part of the script. So, welcome and thank you for joining the roundtable discussion. Uh, we have two chat options. One is on the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize your questions for the speakers, we would like you to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose, but we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing thoughts, posting links to resources, uh, and asking your questions. If you are asking a question of the speakers, please use the question mark at the beginning of the question. This makes it easy for us to scroll through and identify the questions. I share the uh, agenda here because this type of, um, of session that we're doing, we will have some introductions, we'll talk about the plan, we have an exercise scenario, and the exercise scenario is in the chat, but you can also scroll down in feed loop in the um, uh, conference tool uh, under files, and you'll see that you can uh, have access to the exercise scenario as well. That will be an important piece of information uh, to share while we have the session. We'll talk about the assumptions for discussion, and then we're going to move into breakout rooms and address operational and strategic focus from the student perspective, the faculty perspective, and the institutional perspective. And after the, the discussion, we will come back, report out on the perspectives, and come to conclusions. So uh, at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Darcy Hardy, who will give a little bit more of an introduction and share the exercise with us. Darcy? Great. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, we are so happy that you are all here with us. Um, looks like we have over 50 people. Um, we think we have a really great session for you. This is the planning for post-COVID institutions, and it may be not post, maybe it's next phase, um, but you get the idea. Um, we're going to have a structured roundtable discussion, and we are excited to hear your ideas. I think you'll walk away from this session not only having been able to share your ideas, but pick up ideas for other people that you can also use. My name is Darcy Hardy. I'm Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs for North America. I'm also the Director of the Center for Advancing Learning at Blackboard, now Anthology, as of last week, and which is why I'm out of breath all the time right now. Uh, and I've been a member of the WCET steering committee for the past couple of years. There are other committee members that are online and you'll meet some of them during this session. Part of what we do in the steering committee is we help uh, WCET serve its members better. And this particular session we believe does just that. This small working group as part of the steering committee has been looking at this idea of what schools need to be thinking about post-COVID, if we ever get there, or the next phase of COVID, and why we think it's important. So to set the, the tone a little bit, um, you know, some people might say, hey, we're still in the middle of COVID. We're not really ready um, to think about this strategically. Um, why are we going to start to stop and start talking about strategies and things like that, and how we're going to get from point A to point B? We're still trying to just keep our heads above water. There's a few reasons why you need to think about this now, and I'm so, I know some of you have been thinking about it. I want to highlight a couple, um, and, then, and then we'll move on to the next part of our session. First of all, all of you have been in remote learning the last 19 months or so. Remote learning and online learning are two different things. They are not the same. There are very uh, serious differences between the two. One is more strategic and one is a little more rushed. Remote learning is an emergency kind of thing, but we all want programs to be high quality going forward. So you're going to have to think about how pre-COVID we were doing with quality and what your courses look like now. I refer to them as the COVID courses, the remote learning courses. Um, what you're going to do to improve those um, during COVID, really had no time to think about it. Kudos to everyone. You got everything online. That was great. Um, we all know that many of those courses are not at the highest quality we'd like for them to be, and they aren't exactly online learning as we have defined it in the past around quality. So in the next phase of COVID, I can't say post, um, 
what are we going to do to get the highest quality experience for our learners as well as our faculty? And that should be top of mind. So that's one reason why this is important to talk about now. Another reason to think about it uh, in the next phase of COVID is because the competitive landscape for online programs is going to increase significantly. I truly believe this in a post COVID world. There are a lot of schools that during COVID, you know, dabbled in online learning and became remote learning for the first time. Now some of them are thinking, well, you know, that wasn't so bad. Let's go ahead and put our programs online going forward. Now I'm not going to say that the competition will all be quality to quality, but if you want to be competitive, you're going to need to be focused on what those options are going forward and how you're going to retain the students that you currently have and are serving remotely that want to stay that way and how you're going to attract students that you haven't had with new programs. And the competition is going to be such that if you don't have high quality and if you aren't providing support services and all of those things we know make online learning work, you're not going to be a competitor because the landscape is going to be filled. Final thing I wanna point out, online learning, true online learning is not a, an inexpensive endeavor. It's no longer a build it and they will come kind of scenario like we had before COVID and in the early years of online. It can be high cost. It takes a lot of resources to do it well. And you have to think strategically about the market. You have to be honest with yourself about your institution, where you are today, where you want to be, and what you're going to do to be ready going forward. Are you ready right now to meet the needs of more students? by departments that have never gone online and wanna stay online now? What's the vision of your institution in the next five years? Post COVID, are you wanting to be highly competitive? Do you want to attract students? Do you want to increase your revenues through tuition? I'm sure the answer to all of those questions are probably yes. Um, everybody is going digital. And so now is the time to leverage the need. Now is the time to look at what you've learned from online or from uh, remote learning during COVID, what you learned about your institution, what you learned about the market, what you learned about your faculty, your students, and start thinking strategically about going forward in this next phase. So let me, let me close before I turn it over to Tina. Um, to get us started, I would say to think like you're a consultant. Thinking about this like a consultant um, is, is important. And one of the things that we have done a lot in our leadership workshops at Blackboard is talk about having to be on the balcony sometimes. Most of us are down in the seats at the theater watching what's happening next because we've had to. But if you step up into the balcony and start thinking about not only operational, but also strategically, you can see the bigger picture. So as you're going through this exercise, think operationally, think, think strategically, think like you're down in the seats, but then also you're up in the balcony getting that bigger picture so that you can think strategically beyond what's happening right now. We're gonna be giving you a scenario from Monument University and you'll be thinking about the concerns, the gaps, the ideas regarding where your institution is today and where it needs to be going into the next phase. Nothing is off the table. So when you get into your groups and you start reading through the scenario and start thinking, think out loud, brainstorm, put things out there that you think maybe you wouldn't say at your institution necessarily with some of your colleagues, but feel like you're in a group of consultants and you're all trying to figure out the best ways to go forward. And hopefully, you're going to get an eye toward what the most important things are and that you can take those back to your institution. So with that, and there's a fly around me, um, Tina, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I think we're gonna give them a couple of minutes to read through the scenario and understand the assumptions and things like that. So I'll be back working with the institutional group a little bit later, but for now, I'll turn it over to Tina. Excellent, thank you, Darcy. So is everyone ready to put on your consultant hat and help Monument University? Before we get started, I wanna make a few comments about process. 
first, there are some assumptions built into the discussion. One is Monument University will continue to offer online courses until they have a strategy in place and as they bring students back to campus. We, second, we also need to understand the need, how the emergency transition to online went and their, and their current effort to continue to offer online courses. So how did their transition to remote go and how are their efforts going now? This will help them assess their next step. So as Darcy said, we're going to look at these through three different lenses. The student lens is the first lens, which Robert Griffin, Griffiths and I will facilitate in room one. The faculty lens will be facilitated by Preston Davis in room two, and the institutional lens facilitated by Janelle Elias, Elias and Darcy Hardy in room three. Now, each lens will also be considered through an operational and strategic perspective. So we want you to take a very holistic view. You'll be randomly assigned to a breakout room. And each breakout room, you'll have a few ways to be able to participate. Each room will have a shared Google Doc that you'll be able to um, enter in any information. You can also verbally um, share your thoughts in a Zoom room conversation, or you could use the breakout chat room um, function as well. Um, we'd like each group for, to have a volunteer for a recorder and a reporter. And we'll have 20 minutes in each of the breakout rooms and Cheryl will be our timekeeper and will draw us back into the main room so that the last 20 minutes, Rob will do a summary and facilitate um, a report out from each of the groups and a wrap up discussion. So steering committee colleagues, do you have anything to add before we show the scenario and shuffle us into breakout rooms? Other than to say that all of your input is very valuable. So whatever ways you are comfortable in contributing and sharing your ideas, we want you to be able to express it in that way, orally, written, whatever. Just make sure that you're able to, to have your thoughts shared. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Cheryl, are we ready to move into our breakout rooms? Yes, Tina, thank you. So you all have been randomly put into breakout rooms with uh, our, our hosts here who will lead the discussions for you. So we look forward to talking with you all in a bit. I'm gonna send you all to the rooms. Um, you will get a notice of a minute left so you can wrap up and then we'll see you back here in the main room in about 20 minutes. So have a great discussion, everyone, and thank you. Well, welcome back everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your active participation and engagement in your subgroups. At least I know that the student subgroup was very engaging, so I'm assuming the other ones are as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward here to helping to support the conversation and share out and facilitate the conversation for the rest of our time here. And to begin to help set the stage for that, I would like to invite the representative from each breakout session to just share a brief synopsis of the operational and strategic focus areas that their subgroup talked through. And then I'd like to work together to develop some connection points and some ideas across the various uh, breakout conversations to help frame the kind of conversations that you might have with the leadership at your institution or at least for the president of Monument University in this scenario and to help to get uh, our institutions aligned and moving forward in the very near term. So I'm going to start with the student subgroup and Tina was the reporter for that. And so I'll turn it over to Tina. Great, thank you, Robert. And thank you everyone in group one. You did an amazing job. We had a couple themes emerge um, for the operational focus. Um, the first was tech, both in the sense of um, what devices students have, but also broadband and uh, basically digital um, fluency. Do they even know how to use the tech? Um, that if, if they had it, or do they have the ability to, to really use it for learning? Um, we also talked about some more affective things, such as, you know, what was their sense of belonging and how engaged were 
and are the online students um, at Monument University. Um, we also wanted to explore the faculty perceptions about the faculty and the coursework. Um, were their faculty prepared to teach in this new environment? Um, did they give more or less work, harder, easier content? And how did they interact with students? We also talked about accessibility issues such as, um, you know, working with students with disability, equity issues, diversity and inclusion, and how do these elements relate to online learning, and also high impact practices and how that how those might be embedded in the courses and the pedagogy. Um, Robert, would you like us to move on to um, strategy or? E yes, please. Okay, perfect. Well, we also, for the strategic focus, we, we talked about data again, you know, what kind of enrollment trends were there, what kind of success retention program con uh, con continuation, um, but we also want that data to be disaggregated by race, income, gender, socioeconomic status, and, and also looking at future markets, right? Because some of that's a look back and looking at what current students, but really launching new online programs is a, is a look forward. And so what kind of market research is out there? What kind of new markets could we tap into? Um, we had some great stories uh, told from different perspectives as part of our group, and overall it was a really really great conversation. Thanks, Tina. I appreciate the wrap up on that one and the synopsis of what was about a 20 minute conversation. So that was great. Uh, let me turn it over to the faculty group and hear about the strategic and operational focus there. Thank you, Robert. Um, so this is Preston. And although I, I did have um, some, some notes that were kept by the group, um, I, I'm going to start off by doing a summary and welcome the participants to chime in with, with their additional feedback as well. Um, we had a, a very good discussion um, in terms of the operational focus. You know, I think it was pretty clear that, you know, some thought that the online courses were great and had a positive experience, but not all. Um, and it's very important to use those, those faculty champions um, and leverage them. Um, it was also mentioned that this is a classic uh, example of change management and the challenges with any major change at an institution. And it's important to work with those who are interested and sort of the innovative early adopter folks uh, um, because they can help set the example and, and lead their colleagues uh, forward. Um, you know, having a foundation, um, providing tools, and consistency and infrastructure was very important. Um, we know that quality for online courses is, is an issue that has to be considered because there are unique challenges to engaging students in an online setting. Um, and that requires um, some different types of interventions than someone in a face-to-face -face setting might utilize on a regular basis. And so making sure that faculty are, are aware of, of, you know, those, those tools are, is critically important. Um, and it's very important to um, paint a picture of what a good online course design is and what a good online course looks like. And this was a great comment that Shannon made about a shared vocabulary, because I know from my own experience in administration that, you know, different units that have different expertise use jargon and, and terminology that may not be familiar with others across the institution. And so having a shared vocabulary and understanding what the goals are um, as a collective is critically important. There was also su the suggestion of, of mentors um, as well. So in terms of the operational piece, before we move to the strategic focus, would anyone else from the faculty group like to chime in and share uh, your feedback? I think you covered it just fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm earning my uh, I'm earning my pay, right? For this volunteer position. So for the strategic focus, um, looking at the evidence, um, you know, again, student-centered focus 
was was very important. And one of the things that that um, I mentioned, and I think that there was a lot of agreement about, was the fact that it's very important to not only have um, instructional tools and strategies available and assistance for faculty, but the student support services and how student services and the academic side have to work hand in hand in order to support online learning strategies. Um, declining enrollment is a motivator for innovation. That is an excellent quote that I will probably always remember because it summarizes, I think, where all of us have been at some point if we aren't currently there, is you know when you're, you're, you're facing an enrollment challenge, um, that does sort of light the fire to consider new approaches and, and does spark innovation, um, which I think is the example that we see here in the Monument uh, University case study. Um, you know, learning outcomes need to be consistent between online and um, in person. Um, understanding pedagogy and having support for design um, and, and, and understanding the difference in teaching online versus the classroom. Um, you know, having also a, an approach, understanding that the pivot to online or remote instruction during COVID was an emergency situation, but an ongoing permanent online learning presence has to be designed and has to be implemented and has to be evaluated. Um, and I think that pretty much summarizes the strategic approach. Um, again, bringing everything back to the student experience and really focusing on student outcomes was, I think, what, what the, the, the group really saw as being key. But again, I would love to have folks from the faculty group chime in and, and share their perspective in the last minute or two that we have. Okay, Ann. Um, you know, as I'm listening to what we discussed, I realize we overlook the whole idea of the student's voice. I mean, if we're talking about being student-centered, um, we may want to turn to the course evals and the other sorts of things and give the students a voice in terms of how we did and how we may want to move forward. Excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. I'd like to chime in for our group. Obviously, the scenario said that faculty had a rough time transitioning quickly to online education in that particular university. So if they're already feeling very run over, rushed to create a positive online experience in their education, um, then the idea of trying to create a strategic plan for the university to develop online, you better come back to them and say, I need your help. We talked about, David talked about the champion. You need to find who was successful. You need to find the faculty union, the faculty senate president, whoever it is, to be the ones to talk to the faculty. And the, the last thing I think I hold on to is, how do you support the faculty in this kind of transition? They want to know, are you just going to lead us out like you did before in COVID, or are you going to give us some help this time? Technical technology, design, whatever it is, um, we want to know we're going to be supported in this. It's going to be extra work. How are you going to help us out? It's not about the money. It's obviously about the quality of the teaching experience and the learning experience that I remember hearing the faculty talk about after their experience with fall of 20. Great. Thank Thanks, Preston. And uh, Kelly, really appreciate that feedback. Let me turn it over to the last and final group here around the instructional or the institutional side. Uh, operations and strategic responses. Thanks, Robert. This is Janelle. Um, I had the privilege of facilitating breakout three and Joseph Hoey, I'm gonna call on you in a moment, but I'd like to offer as we're thinking institutionally and how we might advise this president and this executive leadership team to facilitate such a broad-based cross-functional change at its institution, we really felt that we needed to start with a strategic vision, a shared vision um, and good backwards design of what does success look like in five years from now, grounded in some practicality of what the institutional context and capabilities really are and resources. So 
we kind of flipped the script, started with strategic and said, you know, that's paramount for us as a starting point. And then to Kelly, to your point, identifying the coalition of the willing, success stories, leveraging nat natural trends that were occurring based on student demand and interest in certain disciplines and really understanding that was an operational focus. I'm gonna pivot over to Joseph who agreed to share out some remarks from group three. Thank you. Oh, for some reason it won't. Thank you. There you uh, are. And, and, and thanks very much for the, the quick intro on what we discussed. And hey, Tina. So yeah, they very, very much we figured that they needed to start as a consultant. We're recommending a steering committee right up front. You need to get the vision going and figure out where you want to go, what markets you want to serve. Um, is it of the local? Is it a statewide? Are you going regional? Are you going national with this? What are you going to do? Uh, the and then in terms of programs, how are you going to serve that market? What actual programs are there? We need to we're con, we're uh, recommending looking at program viability data, marketing data, using dependable sources for industry trends, financial. Nobody's, the president doesn't seem to have a clue about the costs and it's certainly not going to be free. So we discussed about the, uh, what are the costs and what are the components of those costs, such as uh, taking the library online, the LMS, uh, the myriad of other um, costs att um, attendant on online education. We need to find out what other institutions are doing and doing well so we can benchmark and figure out where we need to be and who we need to be. We need a, above all, we need a net right up next to the vision, we need a communication strategy and a change management strategy. It was brought up that if the instruction needs faculty support, then we got to start by talking to our faculty. And it was brought up that they've been treated pretty roughly before. So we have to go back and say, okay, let's work through this together. Let's take it through the governance processes and make sure that we have everybody on board with it. Uh, perhaps we can start with a pilot program. Um, we One idea that was brought up structurally in terms of strategic was, set, uh, shall we start this off as a complete, another another entity within the organization? Would it be better housed in uh, extension or, um, you know, uh, lifelong education, or maybe another whole line, another an online division of the institution? Uh, one person brought up to scrap the online and just work on making the college more hybrid friendly. Uh, it's another possibility. We could go hybrid. Uh, so these are all possibilities that need to be discussed. Uh, again, key to this is having the visioning process bringing faculty on board, having a change management process and understanding uh, the costs and how we will have to budget for that going forward over a three to five year vector. So if I might have missed a few things. Does anybody else want to, buy, to chime in? You did amazing. I would add that we talked about there appeared to be a lack of understanding about the the outcomes of the emergency remote emergency online so some deeper um analysis of trend data and the impact that was having on student satisfaction persistence completion and learning um, so they really needed to take a hard look at at the outcomes joseph thank you so much for your willingness to share out with the big group would anyone else from breakout three like to share anything Janelle, Joseph, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. So now I have the task of trying to pull together some themes from the three different report outs in real time. So I'm going to do my best here, but I welcome anybody else's contribution here too. And I, I picked out four main areas that I heard across the board for us. One is obviously data. We are interested in collecting a lot of different types of data, both aggregated and disaggregated data and having that available and I would also then add, although this wasn't specifically said, presented in ways that are consumable and are able to be uh, given in such a way that we can make decisions and try to move forward and not have to spend all of our time just trying to, to figure out what it is that we have. And of course, that 
requires a lot of uh, data management and structure and, and a system already in place to allow that to happen. So that might be an assumption for us of what we can do with data, but across the institutional wide landscape, faculty and students, I heard collecting and understanding data to make decisions was important. The second one is understanding the experience of what we all just went through. And I think importantly, does the experience jive with the data that we've collected? Are people's emotions and feelings connected with the actual results that we are collecting through focus group surveys and everything else there? Are there trends that are aligning with our emotional state through all of this? The third is a series of questions that I, I would almost frame as what if reflections or what about reflections? What don't we know at this point? What is the gap of information that we have in front of you? What assumptions are we making in these conversations that ought to be challenged that maybe we haven't been challenging yet? In the decisions and in the process that we're going through of understanding the operational and strategic focus areas, Who's invited into those conversations and who's left out by our decisions and by our policies? And I think we've noted across several of these, through all of this, what assumptions have we made before COVID that have now shifted, that have opened up new options and new possibilities to us as an institution? What can be new what ifs for us that before we thought wasn't at all possible? And maybe these are the things that are discovered through steering committees or discovered through cost conversations or resource conversations. And the final one that I pulled out from this sort of brief walkthrough from everybody here is around the institutional culture. And I think this permeates through what everybody was also talking about. How are faculty and leadership aligned with one another right now in ideas, strategies, and directions? Where are there centers of excellence to build from or successes to help drive from? Who are our champions across campus? Who feels ownership of the opportunities and availability in front of us? How is change management managed through all of this? Is that an institutional culture thing? Are we familiar with helping to make innovative change or is that something that we don't really do all of that well? And I have some sub ideas around that, around whether the institutions quite top down in the ability to choose and, and direct where we're gonna go, or is this faculty led and it's more bottom up strategy and that's where the power is within the organization. To the point we just heard, is there consistency in the terminology, expectations, goals? How are that communicated across the university? How easy is it to get everybody aligned and on the same page? What is the governance process associated with that? And importantly, and, and I'm saying this last, but it's certainly not least, if we are a student first mindset institution, are we driving and leading from that mentality of what it is that we're trying to do with our strategy and with our operations? Are we helping to make sure that the student voice and experience is centered to all that we're doing here? So uh, that was a quick sort of uh, reaction to what I was hearing. I was interested if there were others that uh, picked up any other themes or, or concepts. I thought that was an impressive overview, Robert. Thank you so much. No problem. And, and Cheryl, I'm going to turn it over to you for a second for a quick time check. How much time do we have here? We have just a couple of minutes to try to tie it up. I am going to um, re-put the uh, Google Docs into the feed loop because it's my understanding that in the feed loop, it doesn't um, hyperlink well. So um, you'll see a repeat, um, but that's because we're trying to make sure the hyperlinks work, okay? And I do want to say that our, our note takers um, each did put the um, Google Docs for the um, breakout rooms in the chat window for folks to look at. So thank you all for doing that. I'll add one more thing. Um, for everyone who's, you know, in this situation at their own institutions, um, and maybe you're in a position of authority and decision-making and that's great. 
I would imagine some of you are in positions where you feel like you are not part of the decision making and therefore how can I try to make this important to my leadership? I think using some of the comments that came from all three of these groups gives you kind of, um, I don't wanna say ammunition, but you know, it gives you something that you can turn to when you're trying to you know, wave your hand and go, hey, we need, to, we need to think about all this other stuff too and how it impacts our institution. You may already be doing everything and then kudos if you are. Um, I run into very few schools and my own included where I could say that, yeah, we were doing this right. Um, but use those documents as springboard for conversations with people to help them understand what you're seeing um, as being just as important as, as all the other pieces. If it's agreeable for everybody here, I wouldn't mind doing a, a rapid response exercise and give ourselves maybe 30 seconds to think of an aha moment that we've had over the last hour, some realization or way of framing an idea or thought that you th think could be useful in your own conversations at your own institution. And I can give us a, a countdown of three, two, one in, in about a half minute or so. And in the chat, if you would write that down, we all push enter together. Would love to see a string of what are some of the aha moments that you have. So let me give you about 30 seconds for that and then I'll, I'll count us down to push enter. Jump the gun a little bit there. <laughs> and it's so exciting. I know it's hard to wait. <laughs> but believe me, all at one time is pretty darn exciting too. So it'll be all good. Sorry. <laughs> we're we're over anxious. All right, it doesn't have to be a long thing, just a couple of words is fine too. And I'll, I'll count us down at five, four, three, two, one, enter. Thank you very much. Appreciate your participation in that. That's an excellent one, Catherine. That's right. So Cheryl, I think we're getting down to the last minute here. Are there any closing reminders and thoughts for us? Yes, and I would like to thank very much our wonderful leaders here today, uh, Darcy Hardy, Janelle Elias, uh, Preston Davis, Robert Griffiths, and Tina Arskell. Uh, we're very fortunate that they work as a work group for, for the WCET Steering Committee, as um, Darcy shared a little bit ago at the start of the session. So uh, thank you very much. You'll be seeing a survey that will pop up. We please, uh, would you please submit the survey? Uh, the, um, the speakers enjoy learning about um, your feedback and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. So thanks for joining us today and thank you very much to our discussion leaders. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.